You've seen some of the worst atrocities that humanity's perpetrated against itself in the last sort of 20 years, 30 years. Um, are you despondent about what we're able to do and what we're able to achieve? Have we lost trust in each other beyond repair? You know, there are three conditions that I would use uh, or three um, meters that I would use when I visited a country. I would say to myself, does this country suffer from structural discrimination? You know, is there a particular group, minority, under enormous pressure? Are they then deprived of basic social and legal protections and services on the back of that? And does the system run on fear? And uh, if you ticked off all three, then you're in a highly repressive state that discriminates against much of the, the you know, population. And then as you, if you can, if you can answer this, the question satisfactorily, then you, you're moving up, at least the country respects most of its citizens and doesn't run on fear. And, uh, and you know, when you look around the world, there are not many countries that are, have pristine records. I, I don't, actually, I can't think of one. You know, so it's always, all states are sort of projects in progress. But there and are... they, can all, they can all also go very awry. We don't seem to be just losing trust in national leaders. We seem to be losing faith in each other. No, of course. I mean, Karl Weger did the same. He, he talked about the, he, was in, he argued in defense of the small man, you know, the man who was lost in the Industrial Revolution. And it was a transformation akin to what we're seeing now. And people were losing their jobs. People were moving into cities. They were living in sort of miserable parts of cities. And, and he aspired to speak on their behalf. But he was weaponizing their anger, directing it against a certain population. Instead of saying that these are structural issues, we have to look back at the records of previous governments. We have to see where we've defaulted. You know, why wasn't any banker you know, prosecuted in the United States after the 2008-2009 crisis? You know, uh, there are some very sound reasons for it. But uh, you know, if um, 1.3 million people lost their homes because of it, they haven't been given a satisfactory answer. And so they turn then to anyone who seems to be willing to destroy, destroy the system or at least hope to resurrect something drawn from the past, which seems to be akin to some halcyon sort of dream. And it's not, it's not that. My great hope, always mm -hmm. where I found hope, is at grassroots level, real leadership, courageous, selfless, you know, people willing to sacrifice that first instinct of us human beings, which is the instinct of self-preservation. And they were willing to overcome this for the sake of advancing the rights of people. And that gave me lots of, completely the opposite of your typical politician in many right. countries. And that's where we have hope. And that's where I saw you know, humanity at, at its best. I pulled up just some quotes from, from around the world yeah. about you, uh, yeah. Dutarte from the Philippines called you son of a whore. Yeah, uh, my mother was very upset. Right? I bet. Yeah. The North Korean said that you are a plot reading scandal monger. The Venezuelan yeah. said you are a resounding failure. The yeah. Chinese think you're disgraceful. Yeah. The Russian ambassador dismissed you. I mean, completely. Yeah, yeah, I he said, said, he said I had messiah, what is it, a messiah complex and I was mad or something. And then he added that you're provocative, a kamikaze and unhinged. Yeah. Are you any of those things? I'm probably all of them. Yeah. Right. No I, no, I wouldn't say son of a whore. <laughs> the yeah. reactions you invoke. Yeah. Yeah. universally yeah. Ar around the globe yeah. it's astonishing yeah. why are they so scared of you because because you go to the heart of government legitimacy you see what we are asking is a very basic question right you by dint of your constitution right are given the job of exercising sovereignty on behalf of your people right and we will certify whether you're doing a good job or not we're actually questioning whether you're serving your people or not by, uh, by using the human rights measures. So you have obligations, are you meeting them? Are you discriminating against your people? Are you depriving them or you're not? And they don't like it, right? Because it's, it's actually, as a predecessor of mine said, it's when you're in that space between a government and its, and its people, you're in a very sensitive space. To me, it didn't really matter that they say all of this. Because on the other hand, we got, I got lots of letters from civil society actors, people that we'd freed from detention, people that we'd helped uh, recover from torture, 
people who had access to better housing that previously they didn't have. So it, it was always, I believe, a net gain for us. You know, yes, we lose a government, but we, we win the respect of the people. And uh, in the end, it's, that's more important. Uh, after your first term as the UN High Commissioner for Human Rights, when, when that ended, you said, quote, to be re-elected in my job would be to fail. Yeah. What, what, who, what did you lose faith in? Did you lose faith in humanity, in the no. UN or, your, or yourself? No, uh, certainly not myself. Although you always, I think, when you deal with these issues, there is uh, so much pressure from, and expectations are high from the victims of human rights abuses. And you do feel, given the enormity, the, the magnitude of the challenges facing humanity, that there's so much pressure on you to deliver. To be uh, re-elected, I would have needed the support of the permanent five members of the Security Council. Uh, I know I had upset uh, all five, I was five for five, and that the chances of them agreeing to me continuing was practically zero. The only way it could have happened is if I said, uh, or if they said to me, you know, we want you to be quiet on all these different files, and I agreed, then maybe, but I wasn't prepared to do that. You, was it Yugoslavia the first time you went out uh, in the field to, to kind of witness a lot of these things on behalf yeah, of Yeah, it was my first experience with the UN, and I was 30 years old. I uh, had finished my uh, military service in Jordan, and I went as a civilian, and uh, it was the definitive, the key moment in my life, I think, yeah. I think I read somewhere that you saw um, the skull of a small child um, yeah. as, a, as a trophy on the car of a local warlord or, or yeah. whoever. Um, and I think uh, as I sit and speak to you now, I can feel yeah. it affects you quite a lot. Why, why was that moment so important to you? And what did you learn in that moment that you carry through with you till today? Well, it's the, the, the extremes of violence that exist in, in conflict. Um, that you can target children in a way that this still happens um, you know, every day in many parts of the world um, in, in such a savage way and sort of celebrate that by putting the head of the child on the, the bonnet of the car and then putting a UN helmet over it. And he drove up next to us and uh, we were heading down to Sarajevo from uh, Pale. This was at the close of 1994. Um, and uh, yeah, it, it was one of these, so there were quite a few moments like that, uh, which is a jarring moment. And you realize that much as we can celebrate uh, what it is that we achieve as humanity, uh, you know, there's, a, there's still uh, beasts that lie within us. Davos, would you ever speak at it? Well, I have spoken at it. Do you, do you like it? Do you think it's... A, it's I never was never comfortable there. Why? because I felt a significant number of the people attending should be in prison. And, it, they, and to be sort of fated in the way that they were fated, given what they've done to their own people, given, I mean, it's, um, no, there was, it always made me feel uncomfortable. It always made me feel that, uh, you know, if these people really cared about their own people, um, then, you know, it would be acceptable to see them sort of, um, you know, treated and welcomed in international forum. And uh, I mean, in, in the UN, it was the same. At one stage, I said to my uh, colleagues, please don't, I, there was a particular lunch that I didn't like to go to every year because they always seemed to pe put me next to some war criminal. And I said, I, I just don't want to go. And they said, they said, no, 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 you, you know, this year we've made sure you're going to be sitting in, and, and they sat me next to someone I, indicted by the ICC. And I, you know, so I, I'm never comfortable. Yeah. What is uh, your form, former employer, the UN? What, what position does it hold in trying to rebuild this trust that um, people from all over the global south, I'm from Afghanistan, I was born in Kabul. Um, we don't have much faith in UN peacekeepers or ISAF or the international um, goodwill that seems to flow through our nation. Um, I wonder like what, what... Well, the UN, I've always said the UN is as great or as pathetic as the rest of the world is out there. The UN is just a reflection of the rest of the world. If the, if the world is in a pathetic state, the UN is in a pathetic state. 
The, why, is it an apathetic state? Yeah, it's an apathetic state. Why, is, why should the UN be seen as anything different? It's comprised of the 193 governments that make up the world, right? So why, why should they be any better? Conversely, if the, you see a world that's improving, where you see greater respect for human rights, greater democracy, you'll see a better UN. It's not going to be better or worse. The UN is us. Zaid Al-Hussein, thank you so much thank for talking so much. to the Doha debates. Thank you so much.